Welcome everyone to the Ryerson University Ted Rogers School of Management International Sports Business Spotlight, where we will host a series of sessions with top leaders in the sports business, focusing on the future of the global sports industry, digging into industry trends, and hearing some of the great stories and lessons in leadership along the way. My name is Chris Schufelt, and I will act as the host for this 10-part series. I've spent my business career for the past 20 years at Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment, working across all of the different properties that we operate uh, with a specific focus in the last five years on our Major League Soccer business and CFL business as Vice President Business Operations for Toronto FC uh, and the Toronto Argonauts. We're gonna start off our spotlight series here with a very special guest, a proud Canadian, Stacey Allister from the United States Tennis Association. Welcome, Stacy, and thanks for joining us today. Uh, I'm really excited that uh, Professor Sherry Bradish was able to connect us uh, and bring you into our spotlight series. And I'm officially uh, excited to to meet you, not in person as I wish it was, but uh, but over Zoom, anyways. No, it's great to great to be here, and um, I look forward look forward to our chat this morning. Wonderful. So. Um, we're doing this as a podcast series. It's certainly different than uh, if, we, if we were in person. Um, and uh, I always love the in-person interaction in class. You obviously get the, the questions from, from the students and the interactivity. But uh, what we're gonna do is, is uh, we're gonna have a series of questions, a great discussion, and then it's gonna be made available uh, to the students that way. We're gonna innovate and we're gonna do our best through uh, this COVID pandemic. It's the uh, common theme of the pandemic. Innovation and agility. Exactly, exactly. And excited to learn some of that as we get into our discussion today. So first, I want to set the table with uh, with your bio. I think it's important the listeners have a, a really good baseline uh, and help provide context for the for the discussion today. So I'll read your bio that was uh, that was prepared, and then we'll get right into it. Okay. So Stacy Allister is a made in Canada, internationally renowned sports and entertainment leader, champion of equality, and innovator in the sport of tennis. Currently, Stacy is the USTA's Chief Executive, Professional Tennis, and U.S. Tournament Director, responsible for setting the strategic vision for the USTA's Pro Tennis Division, including oversight of the U.S. Open, their other tournaments, as well as the professional development pathway for aspiring young Americans and officiating. Previously, Stacy was the Tournament Director of the Canadian Open, which is now known as the Rogers Cup and VP of Sales and Marketing, where she was the only female tournament director within the ATP Masters Series. In 2006, she was hired as the president of the WTA, and three years later was promoted to chairman and CEO. During her tenure, Stacey generated more than $1 billion in contracted revenue, grew player prize money by 100%, and she oversaw the expansion of the global footprint of women's professional tennis, including a robust Asia-Pacific growth strategy. Look forward to hearing about that. Throughout her career, Stacy has been a fierce advocate for equality in women's sports, playing a lead role in driving prize money growth and securing equal prize money for, for women at Wimbledon, Roland Garros, and WTA major events. Stacy has been named one of the top 50 heroes of tennis in the past 50 years by Tennis Magazine, the Women's Executive Network Hall of Famer, and a sports business journal game changer. In addition, she was recently recognized by Le Keep as one of the top 10 most influential persons in tennis worldwide. In June 2020, Stacy was named the U.S. Open's first ever female tournament director in the organization's 140-year history. Alistair is a graduate of the University of Western Ontario, from which she received her bachelor's degree in economics, her Ivy MBA, and honorary doctorate of law. So, Stacy, again, welcome. I am so excited to be able to, uh, to chat. You've got a great resume, you've done a lot, and you just hosted the US Open during a global pandemic as the first female tournament director. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy. I don't know who, who said it, but uh, someone said maybe everything happens a moment in time and I was the right leader at the right moment. For the, 20, for the historic 2020 US Open and, and the Western and Southern Open that we moved from Cincinnati uh, to, uh, to the Billie Jean King National Tennis Center. That's amazing, that's amazing. So we'll get into that uh, in a few minutes. But first, um, we wanna touch on kind of the current period. And, and uh, you know, as a sports executive, we're, we're all going through this time where 
you know, we don't know what's next and we don't know what's in front of us. But I want to I want to go back and rewind quickly to um, March 11th, which uh, of 2020, which was the day where the World Health Organization declares a global pandemic for us in the sports industry. We're aware Rudy Gobert tests positive for COVID-19 and the NBA shuts down. All the other leagues follow. I will always remember the next day and what happened and the sequencing that happened for us in our organization on Maple Leaf Sports, specifically for me on the soccer side of the business. Uh, I'm curious to hear how you approached that day and the following days, and then how you started to lead as we got into this, as we got into this pandemic. Well, for us, our journey started on March the 8th, actually. Okay. Because that was the first international tennis event to shut down. It was in Indian Wells, California, the BNP Paribas Open. Um, I actually was in Hawaii. We had had a, a, an international team competition, Davis Cup, in Hawaii. And really, that's the last sporting event uh, to be staged in our sport uh, worldwide. So, you know, it was hard to, to sort of look. Well, okay, is this... Is this going to last? You know, we and we had had a Fed Cup up in Everett, Washington, where the first COVID case came to the United States. So it just kind of crept, right? And then it was like, okay, this this could get serious. And then the NBA shut down, and then all the dominoes uh, fell from there. Uh, the uncertainty that we felt then is almost the same today. And um, certainly we know a lot more around how to manage COVID, how to get back to work. But at that time, it was, um, there was lots of hope that we were, uh, you know, afraid of how long it would last. And we went to, we went right to work. So when you talk about how did we approach it, uh, we set up a, a senior team, a business continuity team. And uh, we, we established three fundamental principles if we were going to stage the US Open. So the first one was mitigation of risk. And um, it could not come at the sacrifice of the local community. It couldn't come, we couldn't take tests away from the local community, PPE, and the virus needed to be under control for us to have the confidence um, to be able to mitigate that risk and bring the world uh, to New York City. The second one was, was it going to be in the best interest of tennis? Was it gonna feel and look like a grand slam? Would the players come? That was a big one. Um, throughout the journey, our sponsors and our broadcasters were in lockstep with us. Never once did they, they push us to go and or if we had uh, said we're, we're not able to proceed, they were supportive. So we, we didn't have that. Uh, to contend with, uh, they were aligned. And lastly, um, did it make financial sense? Um, you know, if we were just gonna lose money, why, why put the organization at risk? So uh, the business continuity team uh, worked around the clock. We ended up sort of um, eight to 10 different models. Uh, and, uh, you know, everything from, you know, as you, know you throw it all on the wall, right, Chris? Um, you know, could the, could the U.S. Open, does it have to be played in the United States? You know, at one time someone said, well, what about Guam? Well, it's, you know, it's a territory. What about Puerto Rico? You know, in, in jest, my, one of my colleagues, what about Iceland? You know? <laughs> so we looked at it all, changing the date. Oh, let's go to California. Let's go to Indian Wells. Uh, thank God we didn't do that. Um, yeah. And at the end of the day, we landed the plane. I, I, I use a lot of analogies and yeah. Um, we landed the plane and through science, we had a USDA medical advisory group um, led by Dr. Bernard Caymans, the head of Mount Sinai infectious disease specialist who was on the front lines combating the virus in New York City. That was the epicenter of the virus in the United States um, at the beginning. So they all said, you know, started about May, started to give us some confidence that New York would be in level four of reopening and that the virus in New York City was on the right track. Uh, and through the public health officials uh, and the state government, uh, all the signs were there. Then you had to make that big bet. And we had two cliffs. 
So the first one was June 17th. We announced that we would be a go and that we would move the Western and Southern Open from Cincinnati to, to New York. That was a big play to convince uh, the, the sponsors there. They wanted us to stage the New York and the US Open in Cincinnati. <laughs> so um, that was June 17th, but we knew and we were getting a lot of pressure, particularly from the ATP, that <clears throat> once we got to July 1st, if we were still in a go, then the multiple million dollar losses would start to really tick up. Like we had calibrated as far as we could, sort of that eight weeks out, we could really manage uh, the variable costs, the fixed costs, they were sunk. Um, and so you started to really hold your breath um, uh, on that. Uh, so with all of those models, uh, we landed on no fans on site and millions of fans who watched. Uh, to give you context of financials, we were slated to earn and generate 240 million in net profit over the two weeks. And <clears throat> uh, we set a goal of 45. So, you know, basically uh, 15, 20% of what we had forecasted um, to earn. And we thought that that was still in our best interest. And would the players come? Would it look like a Grand Slam field? You know, and I said to the team at all times, we're never really going to know until the moment they get on, they're going to get on a plane because the virus changes every day. The virus was spiking in the United States. Some, you know, you take that bell curve, those that were, it's fine, we're okay. Cautious, the, the majority. And then those that are just no way, you know, the Ash Barties, Simona Halep's not going to do it. But we had pretty good intel on the journey. Um, good old fashioned communication strategies, multi-pronged players, agents, uh, to get insight, we really felt the players majority would come if they were healthy. And at the end of the day, they did. And we should talk about, well, you'll talk about the, the bubble, but it was a, quite an undertaking to get <clears throat> the players to buy in. Yeah. So Stacey, that was, that's my question. And, you know, in, in our team sports world, you know, we've got the players union and we've got the the teams that that will communicate and and you know we act as team sports when you're dealing with so many individuals across the globe how how does that how does that play out what's that communication strategy who's the lead on that do the players want to hear from someone like you do they want to hear from you know their representatives how how does that work in your world so um certainly um, on the front facing uh, communicator with the athletes. Uh, and obviously my 30 years of running, you know, professional tournaments and the, the WTA, uh, I'm a known entity. And um, uh, I've been with the USTA four years prior. So, you know, they, they know who I am, that's, that's for certain. And obviously the relationships that you have with their inner circle are really, that's the, that's the currency because they are the influencers, right? Coaches, the agents, the parents to some degree, um, the tours. So we, um, we, we worked the strategy directly with the tours. They had two different approaches. The ATP's approach was very much centralized to, to ma the management team. And we had weekly calls with the management team and they would be providing us the feedback we eventually got on an all player call that also had coaches and it had about 500 guys on it. And you know, you could imagine the chaos of that um, as you're smiling at me and laughing at me. And that's pretty much, it was a, it was a show and I won't use the descriptor. Um, and you had everything from, um, you need to pay us more. We're taking this risk. Why are we, you know, why are you doing this? We don't want to come. There was a very strong movement. It's a European-based uh, top 100, 80% of the guys are, are European. All of the top 10 European, uh, the ATP management, they all just felt we should re reboot the season in Europe uh, and just let, let's start in, in Roland Garros. Um, but we kept going with a relentless conviction that it was the right thing for our sport and it was, it was safe. <clears throat> and we had to educate them that just because the virus was spiking in Arizona or in California, it was declining 
And it was at a very low rate in New York City. It's like 50 different countries with 50 different governance models. Um, so that was, a, that was a big part of it. And I had uh, a full host of doctors. I would have four or five doctors on calls with me um, because why well, believe me? And so we, we got there. The women's, uh, Steve Simon, who heads the WTA, had an entirely different approach where we had regular calls with the WTA's player council, so representatives. So you'd have a Sloan Stevens, Madison Keys, and representatives uh, on that along with their board representatives. And then we had the all, the all player calls. Uh, and that was the way in which uh, Steve um, felt it best to manage for the athletes to hear directly from us. So um, it was hours and hours and like a lot of things, what you say there, they hear about this much. Uh, and we know that the science will tell us you need to tell people about the same thing seven times until it actually does register. You had the cultural differences, you had the language differences. Um, <clears throat> and uh, that's where the backing up the strategy to the influencers, um, coaches. Uh, my mobile phone was given to every single player. Everyone has it um, to you know, make yourself accessible and transparent. And I'll give you one anecdote. You know, we had the same strategy with sponsors, uh, broadcast partners. We had, a, we had a session called Ask Us Anything and we did it weekly. And uh, Tom Rinaldi said to me after the women's final, he came over and he just said, I want you to know that I sat on a lot of calls with leaders of sports leagues as they uh, rallied back to return to work, to return to competition. And you by far were the most transparent and candid leader who got on those calls. And I think in times of crisis, you have to do the right thing always and always err on that side of caution and honesty, particularly when you're dealing with people's lives. And uh, you, you, you just can't, you know, you can't mess with them. Of course, the lawyers will, will come in and they will guide you in your, your communication messages, but there's a way to do it. Uh, and um, that was a key to, key to our success. That, and the other thing that happened to us, that not only was the, the players, the, the virus was under control. And thank, you know, we, I tip my hat every day to the people of New York City and all the first responders. They gave us the opportunity because they got the virus and the community uh, did the sacrifices. The other piece for us <clears throat> was the geopolitical nature of government. So you had the local New York City government to, to give us a go. You had the state government that was controlling COVID and their protocols, we couldn't get the athletes into the country. So the federal government, because there's a ban on, on internationals coming in to the country. We had 1200 people uh, that we had to go to Homeland Security and get clearance as to who could come in. And then we had to limit, that was a fun conversation with the, with the athletes. And remember we were the first, so this is also foreign for them. And then the EU put a ban on people coming from the United States. And that's really where things really started to get uh, <clears throat> heated because the athletes said, we're not coming if we have to quarantine for 14 days and we're not coming if you can't get us back to Europe. Think about that puzzle. You know, we had one, we gotta get you back to India. You know, they're coming from multiple different countries. We can't take that responsibility, but we did because no one was helping us. They didn't want the US Open to help to happen. We hired lawyers, international immigration lawyers in Spain, in France, in Italy. We did not leave our destiny to someone else. And um, eventually uh, the ATP um, finally got in the game, started working with the Spanish government. <clears throat> Roland Garros stepped up because um, they knew they needed to help us to get the athletes back into the country. We shared the same exemptions that we got from um, our federal government. We shared our COVID protocols. <clears throat> and finally, there was never 100% whether or not we'd get them back, but we rolled the dice. We had a lot of confidence that it would come. And then the, the, the final juggernaut was, of course, uh, everybody changed their COVID protocols. Some wanted a 
a COVID test for 72 hours, some wanted it 48, some wanted a PCR nasopharyngeal, some were fine with uh, a, a PCR anterior nares. Uh, we had set up different labs. Uh, so every day there was a new, I, I played a game of whack-a-mole, I said with the team. And uh, we, had, we had the new gremlins that popped up every day until last ball on September 13th. It, it's, um, it's amazing hearing that, Stacy. A couple things in, in reflection, because while I, while I can relate and while we can relate, and just to put it into perspective, you're dealing with governments from, I mean, you named four, five countries there. There's more, I'm sure. And we're, you know, our organizations were dealing with a couple countries, right? Canada, US, and, and just the level of um, coordination. You must have some all-star people in your operations team that have just worked uh, tirelessly and have stepped up and become themselves. Maybe they weren't maybe they weren't huge leaders before this time, but they've stepped up and shown themselves as tremendous leaders. We've seen that, but you must have seen that through your organization. Oh, look at uh, the, the USTA is rich in talent and competency. Is one of the the uh, attributes that attracted me to, to to go to the USTA. The US Open is the largest annual sporting event in the world. And uh, <clears throat> there's um, the ingredient to that people, you know, we, we should, you know, we should put that in the parking lot and come back to it. It doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter about really what the strategy is. It's ultimately going to come down to your people. And can they step up and deliver in the live event environment? And we know uh, stuff's going to happen in live events. It happens every day. You don't know what it's going to be. So, you know, we, we are well-versed in crisis management and the USTA is well-versed in security. The U.S. Open in New York City. It's the 20th anniversary of 9-11 coming up. So our director of security is world-class. And <clears throat> when you go to the U.S. Open, getting into the perimeter of the U.S. Open is incredibly difficult. And we've had invisible enemies before whether they were um, you know, uh, contaminants and, and, and bombs and, and those types, those are, that's real um, in, in the event. So the, the security team, those same principles of crisis management and building security, they were applied to then managing the new invisible enemy, COVID, and wrapping in the specialists, the infectious disease specialists uh, and with the doctors, um, that deal with the players to, to build out the, the, the point of care uh, for the athletes. And then of course, obviously um, for the staff. Um, our government relations with New York City, we're on public park lands, very solid, but we haven't worked as much with the state. So that was a new dimension. Um, we, you know, we do have lobbyists, people who are working and have those relationships. Uh, <clears throat> so we, we, the communication channel was very, very much. But uh, Governor Cuomo, he announced that the US Open was happening before we announced it was happening. He wanted it to happen. We wanted it to happen to showcase that New York was back. Yeah. So we were aligned there. And I think it was on May 12th <clears throat> through the USOPC, um, the federal government announced that professional athletes and their trainers could come into the United States because sport as an economy had been shut down. And we all needed it to happen. So, um, but you know, the quarantine piece—not for them not to have to quarantine for 14 days—that uh, took a lot. That took another dimension uh, into the White House, influencers around the White House. I won't have to talk about the chaos in the White House and who makes decisions or wasn't making decisions. <clears throat> that was difficult. And um, at the end of the day, we just did it. Um, we just got them into the country and we self, we self monitored ourselves based on the three principles and on the state had approved our, our COVID protocols. It's, uh, it's amazing as I reflect back on, on some of your early discussions there. Um, it's very apparent that, you know, you took it personally to, to suggest that the health and wellness of the athletes, your staff, anybody working in the sport was going to be top priority. You surrounded yourself with amazing other leaders. You said you had, I think, five doctors on some of your calls. 
uh, you had the right people, you know, giving you that information that maybe you're not the expert in. Uh, all of these things around a global pandemic. Um, so there's a tremendous lesson in, in leadership there. And, and I, I've seen a lot of uh, top leaders in sport um, manage through uh, in a good way. And, and you've seen some others manage through and, and have, have their challenges. So thanks for sharing that. I think that's, um, that was a tremendous summary there. Um, as we, as we um, flip over to a little bit about the business, you mentioned the, tr the tremendous impact that this was going to have on your business and decision is to, to play or not to play and does this make sense and finances have to come into the mix uh, at some point. Gate receipts for our sports, for a lot of our sports that we operate are, are tremendous and it's, a, it's our number one source of revenue. So when you throw that aside, you're left with sponsorship, broadcast rights and, and you know, wherever else we're gonna, we're gonna find dollars. So the athletes are still making their money, a lot of money. And we got to figure out how to pull off these events. How did you how did you think about innovation, and from a business standpoint, and where were you going to drive you know existing revenue, to the best of your ability, and then where is new revenue going to come from? How did how did that how did that process play out at the USTA? So I think for 2020 it was uh, survival, um, and we'll we'll talk a little bit about the innovation, but. For our business model, and I think this is where you, you'll see a parallel uh, to, to, to many of your properties, um, the number one uh, revenue source for us is ticketing and hospitality. So that 240, but 100, 140 million is ticketing and hospitality. 853,000 in New York City, the economic capital of sports and, and of the economy. You know, and, and you're selling, we sell suites for for two weeks for $750,000, not including F&B, you know, a 15, 14 person suite. So it's off the charts, the, the revenue that's in, in New York City. Um, <clears throat> the second revenue source for us is broadcast, it's about 125 million. And we had securitized it. So the ticketing and, and H went to zero, right? Just gone, just like that. We weren't gonna, we weren't gonna get permission, and we weren't gonna take the risk of bringing fans on site. Our broadcast uh, agreements, even if we hadn't gone, were secure. We would have gotten that 140. I'm sure our chief revenue officer would have had some, some challenging conversations. He did have challenging conversations with, you know, it's not the U.S. Open that we, you know, we signed up for, but we, we were able to, to hold on to that revenue. And um, had we canceled, we, we would have kept that cash flow, but we would have that would have put the drain in the in the out years. So that was we didn't want to you know not mortgaging the future of the organization was a fundamental principle in the in the financial discussions. <clears throat> the last area is our is sponsorship, and uh, you know you had every and you're everywhere from a thirty percent to a fifty percent discount, depending upon um, the activation. Uh, we usually sell about 250,000 uh, Grey Gooses. It's called the Honey Deuce, the official drink. So you can imagine the conversation with Grey Goose. You know, they're, they're going to be closer to that 50%. The premium brands like J.P. Morgan Chase and Mercedes that are, are very much about uh, the brand exposure. But, you know, for them, they'll, they'll cover their sponsorship through one deal that they're going to do in their suite. So every it was all down. But um, <clears throat> so that's... Broadcast was the underpinning, you know, and NBA doing the bubble. You saw the Bundesliga, every single league that's been able to rise, the NHL, they're doing it because of the broadcast revenues. The secure, the, those properties that don't have it, they're the ones struggling. Um, and they just can't, they can't make a go of it. So that's, uh, that was kind of our approach. As we now look to 2021, if you want me to pivot there, I can, I can do that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so it's a January 22. We don't know if we're going to be allowed to have fans. I really think we're confident. Uh, we, we, we know how to do the no fan model and we know how that pencils. For the organization, it's a disaster uh, um, to, to go two years from making 240 to making 50. Uh, you know, we're the national sport governing body. So we've already lost 25% of our staff and we've already decimated our programs. And we've already taken an ex a new line of credit 
to still want to mortgage the future. So what we've decided, our control budget is a 25% socially distanced US open. And we're hoping that we can, <clears throat> we can get that net profit into the 120, 130 million range. Um, lots of work to be done in that space. The lever here, obviously we have the broadcast revenue. The sponsorship revenue will come up, but it's still not gonna go to 100, not 853,000 um, on that basis. And um, the ticketing and the hospitality, we're obviously going to maximize our 25% with the maximum of the, the premium product. Those courtside seats, the whole manifest will be redone, the suites, um, alternative, outdoor corporate H um, assets to be developed. So the innovation for us is happening around that. Um, and the innovation that did happen, uh, but you know, we didn't, we had pennies on the dollar to be able to do it, was the acceleration of our engagement with the digital fans. You know, we're so reliant on the linear world, you know, at that 125 million, uh, we've been doing social media, but very and, and you know very careful about our content. Anything that had a live bouncing ball, couldn't even, we wouldn't even shoot practice courts for for any fear that would come from our broadcast partners, even though they didn't have the rights. But we've been very very mindful of that revenue, and it's secured at 2025. It's not like uh, you know it's tomorrow. So it it accelerated us into that social media world. Um, it helps with our global international strategy, you know, for the US Open, our growth strategy had three pillars. Uh, uh, the content of the first week, you know, the qualifying week, shouldn't even be calling qualifying week, uh, <clears throat> um, because you've got the top 100 to 200 players playing but for seven days, you got all the top players practicing. We've, we've uh, created a fan week, you think about the Super Bowl, and uh, the NHL, uh, you know, the lead in to the Super Bowl is a week long festival <clears throat> with all the players. So we're doing all of that now. And that drove attendance. So we, our goal was to get to a million fans in three years, uh, to go global <clears throat> in strategic markets where we would drive engagement with a younger global fan to support content rights, particularly on the digital platform. So you can imagine we did our research, China, Brazil, uh, so that came to a screeching halt, but we still were able to do some through uh, social and tourism. You know, if, if our number one revenue source, right now only 15% of our, our fan base is international. If you can get another 5%, you know, that's really, really material dollars uh, <clears throat> to bring in that, that, that tourism uh, market. So 25%, um, we have a 75%. I keep saying to the team, stay in your dream world. We just don't know. You know, Dr. Fauci said today, by the time of the end of August, we'll have some sense of normalcy. We don't know how fast this vaccine is going to roll out. And the science today, this is, you know, the misnomer of the vaccine. If I get it, it's going to, you know, protect me. I don't know for how long, but it doesn't mean if I get the virus, it doesn't mean that it stops me from spreading it. So, and consumers, are they going to come back? And there's a lot of caution. Um, so we have time, but we don't have time. It's really going to be interesting what the crystal ball unfolds for us in the next six months. Are, are you, uh, what leagues or other entities are you watching right now with open eyes as you guys prepare for 2021? For me, I, I said uh, the other day, you know, the NFL and, and putting the amount of fans that they put into venues, you know, there's, there's, there, there's optimism in that. For me, there's some, you know, I look at it and I say, well, there's a lot of people in there um, for now, but but what leagues are you watching right now or, or what's catching your attention? So I uh, definitely follow um, our North American leagues and I'm sure you felt it. The, the one thing the pandemic uh, has done, it, it brought the entire professional sports community together. There wasn't a phone call I couldn't make domestically or abroad to a leader to share their plans to help. Because when uh, the NHL was successful or the NFL, 
it only helps to breed confidence with, with players, with business partners and with government. Um, so um, I, looked, uh, I looked very much, well, for 20 it was the, the PGA Tour, it was the, what the NBA was doing big time. Um, the NFL hadn't started by the time we got into it, but obviously they are having fans now is a good, good litmus test. Um, European, the Bundesliga was in May um, going back. They were really the first. And uh, Kristen Seaford, the, the CEO there, couldn't have been more forthcoming to share with us. The piece of dimension for us, international sport, international athletes. I couldn't just talk to the athletes, well, you know, the NFL is doing this or the NBA is doing this. Uh, <clears throat> the European PGA Tour, which is run by the great Canadian Keith Pelly. Uh, so Keith and I uh, <clears throat> were engaged because he brought back an event in Austria. Um, and he was dealing with international athletes getting into Austria and then they had to go to the UK. So working with uh, his team on, on protocols and, and, and GR uh, strategies, um, that was helpful. Um, so today really, uh, it's probably the NFL the most and with bated interest on how the NBA will do. We're outdoors. I think that we, that's a benefit. <coughs> we were thrilled that the, uh, the Governor Cuomo the governor of New York State gave the Bills the opportunity. Uh, my old uh, team, having grown up at the Niagara region, yeah, um, uh, that six thousand fans could attend the Bills game. So the, the more we can creep into that world, uh, it's just going to build more confidence again, consumer confidence, athletes, um, and you just have to be, you know, with this virus, you have, you can't, you you have to be relentless. You know, you know, as evidenced by the lockdown that's happening uh, in Ontario, and um, you know, in Florida, there's no COVID uh, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to self-police, <laughs> um, and it's it, it's it is a dangerous and deadly uh, virus. Um, we can return to work, but it takes uh, the rigor of the testing, the masking, the distancing. Uh, and let's see how the vaccine helps us get back to normalcy. More, more so uh, this year, we have seen leaders uh, come together. Like you said, uh, there wasn't a time where you couldn't pick up that phone. And I know uh, in our organization or across the leagues we operate and we felt the same thing because everybody, every call you make, everybody's in the same situation. There's no playbook. We're figuring this out together. What are you doing? You know, And as much as we were in that situation last year, I, I been tend to saying it's kind of like Groundhog Day right now because we're doing the same thing again this year and we're relying on some of those similar people or calling on new people to see what they've done. So um, no, I couldn't agree more. So I'd, I'd like to um, to flip the switch a little bit back to uh, some of your time at the WTA specifically. And I want to talk about the work you've done and the tremendous leadership that has happened with regards to um, gender equity in sport and the sport of tennis specifically, um, it seems like tennis was ahead, light years ahead of some other sports in this space. And that's not without uh, the effort, the hard work and determination to get it to that point. I'd like to hear a little bit about um, your, your position in this space. And you know, one, you've clearly made it um, a goal and a mandate for, for the work you've done in your career. Uh, but two, some of the biggest tennis tournaments in the world, uh, you brought pay equity into the mix and, and the teams that you worked with brought that into the mix. So one, congratulations and thank you for doing that because um, it, it took too long, but it got there. And a lot of sports are still trying to figure it out. But I'd love to hear a little bit about that. I know it's open question, but um, I just would love to hear some stories about how you, how you approach that. Sure. Uh, well, certainly... It was 2006, I had just joined the WTA as the president, and it was the number one project to get equal prize money at Roland Garros and at Wimbledon. Maybe we'll do the history to bring context. In 1973, the US Open provided equal prize money. Um, in 2001, Australia offered equal prize money. 
And then in 2006, uh, we still didn't have equal prize money. Wimbledon and Roland Garros were at basically 93%. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, to your point, it's, it's, it's taken forever and uh, there's still so much work to do on diversity and inclusion in sport, not just with uh, a quality of pay, but a quality of representation, um, which is obviously a whole other topic, but um, we'll go and we'll, we'll, why tennis? Why has tennis been able to do it? And as business leaders, you need to know how to leverage your assets. And the first asset and the most important asset are your athletes. Because we're just talking heads. And tennis was blessed with a woman by the name of Billie Jean King. And in 1970, Billy and eight other women, they're called the original nine, they really established professional sport for women. And they took a stand against the establishment of sport, the traditionals, the, the grand slams. And they decided that it wasn't fair, that the men were making $12,000 for an event in California and the women were making two. Uh, grand slams, they wouldn't even get money. You know, they talk about, you know, they got a toaster and the, and the guy's got some money. Um, and this is 1973, and I realize many of the students uh, can't even imagine that. <laughs> um, but uh, it was an, an incredible time. So they stood up, they lost their sponsorship endorsements, they were banned from playing. And a woman by the name of Gladys Hellman said, I'll find a sponsor. And they staged the first women's only event uh, for $5,000 in, in Houston, Texas. We celebrated the 50th anniversary of the original nine this year. It was a shame that we didn't have them with us in New York, but uh, <clears throat> they are the foundation and it's about athletes advocating. And as administrators, we then help with strategy and the communication and we'll come back, uh, we'll come back to that. The next asset and leverage is the financial investors. You need sponsors who are gonna take the risk. And tennis, tennis was blessed at that time in the 70s. Um, it was tobacco and tobacco sponsorship was prolific uh, as part in sport uh, back then, it, it just was. Uh, you look back to some of the communication, you know, they, they thought smoking was gonna make you healthy. It's, I know it's insane to even contemplate it, but so we had, uh, we had sponsors that said, we'll step up. And that's one of the things that's still missing. We have a lot of people talking about our values and we believe in equality, but 99% of every sponsorship dollars goes to men's sports. 93% um, uh, of the media coverage is to men's sports. So um, <clears throat> we had sponsors who invested and they have done it for 50 years. You have the risk takers of the promoters who are also decided we're gonna raise our hand. And the WTA was established in 1973. Billie Jean King, I think about athlete. She was playing, she played the Battle of the Sexes match against Bobby Riggs. She formed the WTA tour and she's winning Grand Slams and she's advocating for equal prize money <clears throat> against the US Open. Like uh, it, it, that was our gift. So, you, you, so much of, of everything we have in our sport uh, goes back to Billie as a reason it's the Billie Jean King USTA National Tennis Center. It's the only stadium in the world named after a woman. Lastly, a common ingredient for our sport <clears throat> that gives us that competitive advantage, we have global annual events that men and women play on the same stage, big stages. We have the four Grand Slams. <clears throat> and so the tours can build off of that and build the global nature of it. What ends up happening during the Olympic games? We see these amazing male and female athletes and we fall in love with women's sport. We can look at soccer, we can look at hockey, you can look at the gymnastics, athletes, track and field, you know, you name the sports. And when those female athletes are competing, we are inspired uh, by them, but what ends up happening? those sports go dark for four years, out of sight, out of mind. And we're in that attention economy. 
that has to be constant. It has to be 365. The one benefit of the digital economy and the, and, and the transformation we're, we're making from linear to nonlinear is that in the cost of production and the cost of being able to go direct to consumer and, and to not have to have that quality broadcast that happens for the Leafs and the Raptors, those properties that are not research or financially uh, rich, they're gonna be able to go direct and they're gonna be able to get that content and engage with the younger consumers, but their athletes have to step up. <clears throat> and uh, we're seeing that. We're seeing that with the hockey players, we're seeing it with the soccer players fighting for equality. Um, and they're having their original nine moment um, that our sport has had. It's, um, you know, it's interesting. And the, the, the point of the four major tournaments, men and women on the same stage, right? Fans are, are paying top dollar for both men and women. Uh, it makes sense that tennis was, was leading the way. But um, your point on, on, um, on Billie Jean King, um, it's amazing the ability for her to be able to balance and do all those things at the same time, still be at the top of her game. And um, it, there's, an, there's some athletes out there with this last year, you've, you've seen um, take a, a leadership role and whether it's through the social justice movement, uh, gender, gender equality, et cetera. Um, one of the people that I'll talk to later on in this speaker series is, is um, an athlete and uh, he is his dedicated just as much time and maybe as he's playing to to this movement uh, with an organization and it's impressive so I, I, I can see it's a it's a special type of person uh, it takes and I think you know when we think of when we think of sport sport brings together communities it is a it is a business drives economic development uh, but ultimately inspires communities and it changes people's lives and one of I think the reasons, uh, obviously everything in my professional life has come from tennis, but tennis changed my life. Tennis changes people, sport changes people's lives. Even if you're getting together socially to watch a hockey game, you've brought people together and, and we, we, we made new connections, you're reconnecting. It's transformational and athletes have a responsibility um, to find a way <clears throat> to be an exceptional role models. And there will be those who we really look to, a, a, a Gretzky, who still to this day is giving back to the community sports. Um, Becky Scott, the work that she's doing at, um, in the Aboriginal community, those are, I believe, are champions. And those are the ones that, that use their, their, their gifts and their talents off their competitive field to make a difference um, in our in our countries and and with youth and and, and I you know we, we take to from bill, building on Billie Jean you know she certainly educates the athletes uh, as, as the years are getting on uh, people we have to remind them of the journey and the hardship you know our athletes today can't even comprehend what Billie and the original nine did but that's important but again we go to 2006 and we had our modern day Billie Jean King coming back to the same central strategy of assets, athletes. <clears throat> and uh, Larry Scott, who was the, the CEO at the time, called Venus on the eve of her Grand Slam final to come with Larry to the All England Committee, a group of all men, all white, all older, one woman, <clears throat> and uh, advocate to go from 93 to 100. Let, let's stop this game. And Venus said, sure. And from that moment on to the next 12 months, it was a relentless strategy with our modern day Billie Jean King as our voice. Billie Jean was involved. Our sponsor, Sony Erickson, uh, was involved and they were based in the UK. We engaged with the local British government. We actually had the Ministry of Sport, Tessa Jowell, who was a woman at the time, say on the floor of the, of the, the British Common House, uh, my lords, is it right that the women are not paid equal? Tony Blair supported it. And what was going on in the UK at that time? London was trying to get the, the Olympic Games <laughs> and London was building it. And it was a brand assault. We engaged uh, a PR firm uh, based in Ireland. They did public opinion surveys in the UK and in France. We had the data. We were really lucky at the time. 
women's broadcast rights. <clears throat> um, we're stronger than men's. Um, <clears throat> and uh, we just loaded them up with the data. And at the end of the day, Wimbledon had a new CEO, Ian Mitchie. And he basically said to the, to the blokes, guys, this is not worth it. Our brand is getting damaged. It's not worth it. They were just stuck on their principle. They were stuck uh, in the past. And uh, you know, the 27, 2007 uh, Wimbledon, uh, we finally got equal prize money. And um, it was pretty special for me that, uh, that I think Venus won it and Billy was there and uh, got to see both of them together. It was pretty magical. So that's a that's an amazing story. Twelve twelve months of all out. Oh, it was all out. Like just yeah. and to be honest, it was had been we were we were on the one yard line. It was we were at ninety three percent. So this was the accumulation from nineteen seventy three to two thousand and seven of relentless work by administrators who had come before, <clears throat> by the athletes who had stood on Billy's shoulders and advanced the movement. But we were at that tipping point and we were at that societal moment. <clears throat> and I think that's exactly how the hockey players and the soccer players have rightly uh, stepped up and taken advantage of this. And I think societal, societal wise, we're in this moment. <clears throat> you know, Canada is a much richer, diverse culture. You know, I'll go on a, a, a Zoom call with. Canadian colleagues and it'll be a mosaic. You know, I go on an American call, it's pretty white <clears throat> and, um, you know, and pretty male. Um, obviously, uh, not to be political, but what happened in this country two days ago with the first female um, to, to be the vice president, <clears throat> a person, an African American um, of Indian descent, that's a game changer for a country like the United States. <clears throat> and all of the social injustice um, and the youth movement, you know, uh, that's happening and what's different uh, and what people tell me right now around social justice is the mosaic. You have youth, you have black, white, Asians, uh, all marching together that enough is enough. And obviously we have a new leader who has made it a mandate. Uh, <clears throat> to deal with social injustice in this country, finally. Um, so. It's um, you, you do an amazing job at breaking down step by step how you've gone through this this process. This is uh, I'm, I'm taking notes here because it's it's pretty spectacular, even though I can I can rewatch it. Um, so it, your, your three stage process there for for pay equity and, and equality, um, not all organizations, not all um, sports would have that third phase, which is that major tournament on that equal playing field. So you're really relying on the athletes and you're relying on sponsors to come in a, in a big, big way. We're seeing it, what's happening with women's hockey here uh, in our country um, with, with the professional women's um, union and what they're doing and the, the, the advocating that the athletes and the sponsors are doing. So you can see that loud and clear coming through and and we hope to see a lot more of that um, as, as we move forward. So that was that was really great. So Stacy, your your experience at the WTA, uh, one of the other major strategies that um, you deployed there was your your global growth strategy, specifically what you were trying to do in in Asia and the Pacific. So I remember years ago I'd heard you speak at uh, a conference, and you talked just about the phenomena of what was happening in uh, in Asia and some of the athletes that were really helping bring that strategy forward, um, the on the ground activation and just the masses of people that would, would come out. Love to hear more about uh, how you grew that part of the, uh, the world for, for world tennis, um, such a huge population and uh, some great athletes coming from that part of the world as well. So, oh, again, another open question, but- uh, okay. <clears throat> um, Well, certainly, you know, we'll, I'm certainly known to be a trailblazer. I uh, am one of those people who achieves the goal and I you know, don't allow myself to uh, enjoy that accomplishment for too long and immediately uh, thinking about, you've got a, a, a global map behind you. We live in a global world and um, you've got to look at the business. Uh, you've got to look at your domestic business where the foundation of your revenues are. 
But when you run the WTA, Billie Jean's uh, goal was that any girl in the world, if she wanted to play professional tennis, would have that opportunity. So we were uh, very rich in uh, the Americas, in uh, events, uh, obviously in Europe, uh, we, we established a footprint in the Middle East, <clears throat> and uh, obviously a, a some in Australia, but uh, really uh, not in China and in, in Australasia and, uh, and, and in India. So we were redesigning uh, the tour calendar and we knew that we needed uh, a big event in uh, China. Uh, there was one in Shanghai, it was a men's event and that we needed that, um, that anchor to be able to build the product long-term. Um, we, we, uh, we launched uh, an RFP for bids <clears throat> and this is where the, the political nature uh, comes in. And uh, we wanted a combined event. Again, the strategy of combined events, right? It was established on an amazing uh, city, an amazing promoter there, um, uh, that we would, we would put our big mandatory event with equal prize money in Shanghai. And we have four of those today. We have Indian Wells in Miami and uh, Madrid, and now uh, the China Open. But our grand plans to, uh, to go to Shanghai uh, were course corrected by, uh, the, by the central government of China. And uh, Larry Scott and I were in, uh, in England at the time and Larry got a call from the Chinese government and said, uh, the Minister of Sport would like to meet with you, Larry. And basically we were told, you will not put your event in uh, Shanghai. <clears throat> you will put your event in Beijing, which was the central capital. And I can liken it to, to Canada. Uh, you've got the two big economic markets with Toronto and Montreal. The model that the Rogers Cup uses to have those events in the two cities is actually a very successful business uh, equation. Also culturally uh, makes a lot of sense for the, for the country. So I understood that <clears throat> very well as being a Canadian uh, and serving and developing the sport. So. What we then did, we said to the Beijing government, okay, we will um, put our event in Beijing. You'll build us a state-of-the-art stadium. That uh, was, of course, no problem. Um, <clears throat> and uh, you will help us establish a WTA Asia Pacific office in Beijing. And they underwrote the establishment of a WTA office um, from 2009 onwards. And it, we're taking a play out of uh, David Stern's um, China development market, which he really was the visionary. You know, he went to China knocking on the doors of CCTV saying, here are, the, here are the basketball tapes, put it on air to bring exposure to NBA basketball. Um, there was no Lee Na at the time when we were doing all of this. So we were building a foundation and you had to, we had to educate the Chinese people on the rules and you needed to be in market to understand their culture and to build relationships with government. That's how China is run. And this was again, 2008, 2009. So we established uh, the office, put a small team, uh, <clears throat> only uh, a couple expats uh, and most and hired locally so that we truly could uh, doing grassroots uh, programs um, in, the, in local schools uh, obviously working with the Chinese Tennis Association, they would you have to be a partner um, with them and, and navigating how China operated and making sure that you maintained your um, values and business practices um, from our part of the world. Uh, that, so that was uh, interesting to navigate. But ultimately it set the foundation and then more and more cities in China wanted what Beijing had. And their, um, it, it, what they were doing in the, as a country and in local communities, there was economic development. There were real estate plays. They were building sport within, re, within uh, housing developments. And we see that in, in, in uh, many of the, the major leagues here um, where new stadiums are being built alongside of retail and of residential. And uh, so that was their foundation. China also aspirational for, for more Olympic games. 
and uh, and wanting to show um, show the world that they belonged in the in the global sports economy, because as we know, and they are now on track. Uh, to 2028 to become the largest economy in the world. And when we were doing our strategy, it was 2040 that they were going to become the largest economy. So we, we, we were looking long-term, it takes a big bet, it takes a lot of patience uh, and you calibrating your core business and investing uh, abroad. And certainly it comes at a cost to diversify because there's only top 10 top 10 players. It's not like you can just manufacture more product uh, and put these events here. So events started to wane in other parts of the world. You get a lot of criticism, you know, tennis was the epicenter in, in, in North America in particular in the US, but it gravitated to Europe and then it's gravitated there. And a key competitive advantage for tennis, we are global. It's made up of global athletes. 55 events in 33 countries with major pillars every single year. We are either the number one or the number two participation sport worldwide, um, but we're not optimized on a revenue side. So it's a, it's a competitive advantage um, for us. The other piece of this puzzle is 60% of the world's population lives in Asia Pacific. You cannot be isolated um, and so myopic that um, <clears throat> Your, the future of your business is going to come off your current business model. You know, the mistake that anyone would make in, in business is to think you create, you maintain, you, and, you, and you create again, or it destructs. And you can see if you haven't innovated your business models or your product, you ultimately become irrelevant and you become irrelevant very quickly today. And you just are going to lose your audience. And um, it's difficult to be all things to all people. So it has to be done in a very measured way. Um, but that, that, that is the big strategy. Um, during the journey, you know, we had two events in China. When I left, we had six. I think we had 27 in Asia Pacific, including <coughs> the year end final, the WTA finals, which were in Singapore. Again, in that deal, uh, we did set up an office in Singapore. We felt it was important if we, uh, the, the, the government was investing in us and that was a private uh, public sector joint bid and partnership. Um, but we worked with uh, Singapore Tourism uh, Board and Ministry of Sport. And what the strategy is in China is obviously incredibly different in Asia Pacific, <laughs> in APAC. <clears throat> so um, that was another opportunity for us and we grew that asset. and. And look, uh, when I started, the WTA finals made zero, zero. You know, we just had the event. Players made three million. Uh, the latest deal after Singapore now is a five hundred million dollar deal. The athletes are making twenty four million, and the organizations making the rest. Transformational, but it's a long, long. And you you got to build your business on uh, not sandcastles. You can't build it on one athlete or two athletes, because the athletes will come and go. Um, but, uh, you know, and that's been the success of the Rogers Cup. And, uh, and we built it with no top Canadians, really. Yeah. Um, and now the dream has come and, and, and it's been realized to have top Canadians at the game. It, it's that balance of being prepared to invest now in what will be a future $500 billion broadcast deal and, and what will be right. And, and organizations being prepared to do that, to take that, you know, short term, medium term risk uh, to get to that to that longer play. Um, in some of the leagues we operate in now, it's you know it's it's similar. There's there's that future broadcast that you're working towards, and and that's what what the goal is, and that's what the laser focus is is towards. Yep. So everything you said there was was really resonating towards some of what we're seeing in our in our properties mm -hmm. as well. Absolutely. Okay, so we'd like to. Uh, I've got a couple things to to wrap up with, and I think this one's really important because as this is part of a, a Ryerson uh, International Sport Marketing class. We've got um, students that are across um, different marketing functions, PR, communications, uh, general marketing, sports focus. I think we had one accountant that was in the, uh, in the class when I, when I saw it as well. Um, but the future state of the sports executive, you know, in my 20 years in the industry, the, the, the look, what the sports executive looks like now is different than, than what it may have looked like back then. 
um, in certain functions in certain ways. But I'm curious to hear your thoughts on, you know, whether it's a few skills that that future sport, sports executive needs um, to move forward in the post-COVID world, or do you feel it's the same and maybe it's just tweaked a little bit? Um, certainly, I think the profile, um, when I first started to look at um, the sports marketing, um, I read What They Don't Teach at the Harvard Business School by Mark McCormick, who's the founder of IMG. I think it's still a fundamental, the, the principles still exist, but there was either two paths. You were getting your MBA or you were a lawyer. And if we, we look at a lot of the, the commissioners, many of them have a legal background. Um, some we're not starting to see financial background. So for the accountant, uh, the business partnership with finance is, is, is super, super um, critical. I took a general management approach. Uh, I, my, my, my specialty was, was sales and marketing and uh, <clears throat> delivered in, in, in spades growth, uh, uh, financial growth. Um, <clears throat> and, but I took the general management approach to not have to know everything but to be able to bring together the subject matter experts. So uh, I, I think you can still do that, uh, but you, you know, the, the most important thing is to be forward thinking and to understand <clears throat> the trends, to understand your consumer. What do, what do fans want? <clears throat> you know, it's not rocket science. What, it's not what the property wants or needs and wants to sell but you've got to put yourself in the shoes of your current customer, your future customer, because ultimately that's what the brands and the broadcasters uh, want um, <clears throat> to be able to, to be able to influence and, and ultimately sell their sell their product. Obviously, <clears throat> the very significant area of growth uh, that we're going to see in the next uh, five to ten years is going to come uh, all around <clears throat> this digital. Uh, economy that we have. Uh, I do think um, sport has grown up. It's still a long way to go in um, data and analytics. Some sports are far more progressive than others. Others have been laggard. Tennis has been a laggard in, in that space. So <clears throat> it doesn't mean you have to know how to do stats, but you have to know on the type of information uh, that you need and, and how to analyze the data and to be data-driven focused. Um, and uh, I do think you have to have that innovative mindset and you have to have um, in in incredible agility. And I like to say um, ego stands for edging, edging good things out. You need a lot of humility as a leader and you need a lot of empathy. We don't talk about, I hate it when people talk about the soft skills, but you know, the one thing that I learned, and I went crashing into the wall pretty quickly when you're hard driven, driven to get the results, is what, you know, like we call it that emotional intelligence. Leadership is a journey. And uh, the more you know, the less you know. And ultimately, uh, you've seen it. You've seen very wealthy properties, businesses, have lots of money. Uh, they have strategy and their business falls away. You know, I don't know what the data point is, but the number of Fortune 500, country, Fortune 500 companies that are obsolete in like a five year period, it's phenomenal. So you can never get complacent. You've got to be thinking forward and ultimately it's your people. It's your people that you wanna set the vision, you wanna be the strategic leader and you want to empower them and, and uh, get them to deliver. And, you know, you talked about it earlier, resilience, especially in, in, our, in our world. I don't know any other world, but I'm sure it's similar. We have deal in live sports. There is always going to be a crisis. We just don't know what it is. Um, so you just have to be ready every moment of, um, this is not just unique to the pandemic. There's gonna be stuff that happens. Geopolitical, um, weather, or, you know, earthquakes, terrorism, social unrest, protesters, you name it, it's coming. And so all of that, you know, you need it and you need that resilience. And, uh, you know, I think it's understanding all of those attributes are ultimately what make great leaders. And you, you commented, some are just phenomenal during the, uh, during the pandemic. Uh, 
I give myself a B. Um, uh, and I think, you know, it's important is we can talk about how great I am, but who really cares? Uh, it's really what, uh, what, what, what did I learn and what can I share? So the first thing I've learned is that, you know, the sooner you understand emotional intelligence, you understand yourself, your strengths, and the areas that you um, have blind spots in. I'm not going to say weaknesses, because none of us are perfect, <clears throat> but they are areas that you should be aware of. There's a great tool, it's called the Berkman tool. And what it does, it just identifies where your stress zones are. So for Stacey Alistair, she gets stressed when she's worried. And when I'm worried, and when you're worrying about the lives of 5,000 people, then maybe I overanalyze and I don't make my decisions as quickly as possible. <clears throat> and so for me, that is something that I have to be pretty mindful. Uh, I can't change the world. I can't take it all on. Um, and you, you know, we went deep into, you know, I didn't, I didn't sleep very much for six weeks. Our bubble was six weeks. And every morning I woke up at 6 a.m. turning my phone on, thinking someone would have COVID. And you think someone could die or multiple people could die. That was heavy. And uh, so the, you know, that personal resilience, you know, they talk about it, mind, body, soul, it's real. <laughs> it is so freaking real. And you need it in the times of leadership and crisis because everyone's looking and watching for you. And I just got too fatigued. You know, how do I have done it differently? I did it all, you know, I did the meditation, I did the walks, I did the exercise, <clears throat> but as I rode into it, uh, it, it got really, really, really tough. So I just have to be really mindful of it, but knowing your self-awareness and knowing how your team is feeling. Like right now, we need to lead with more heart and more empathy for our colleagues. You guys are isolated. Uh, you know, look at the students. You know, we would normally be in a classroom and we'd be having a, an amazing, amazing personal experience. I'd be feeding off of them. They'd be feeding off of me, vice versa. We don't have it. This is the best we can do. Um, and and uh, being really, really committed to your teams, that's, that's, the, that's the, the success of any uh, winning leader. Well, that, um, that, was, that was amazing. Uh, and yeah, you, you see it, 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 uh, it comes through the screen, your message here. So that's good. Everybody will, everybody will feel it. So that, again, that's the best we can do. Uh, we'll wrap quickly with this one. Last year, sorry, 2019, a Canadian wins your tournament, the U.S. Open. Uh, how did that make you feel? And I, brought, I bet it brought you back to when you were at Tennis Canada, the development programs, the grassroots, because you've, this is what you've lived for so many years, there's a lot that probably came into your mind. And it wasn't just about that one individual winning, although you were super happy for her. I'd love to hear about uh, you know, when Bianca won. Yeah, look, as I said earlier, everything in my professional life has come through the sport of tennis. You know, I was that little kid from a little, little town on the US-Canada border uh, near Niagara Falls. I was given a racket, six weeks of lessons and a membership at the Community Tennis Club. I became the chairman and CEO of the number one professional women's sport in the world, ran the Canadian Open and I ran the US Open. No one would ever have believed that that would ever happen and it has happened. And so this passion and this love for the game that's given me everything to, to see a Canadian win the US Open in front of me at my tournament, is that like the, the, the cherry on top? And um, the emotion that I felt there, uh, I've been on a long journey with Serena Williams. It was number 24. And uh, that my heart was sinking for her, but it was Bianca's day and she crushed it. You know, 24,000 New Yorkers in Arthur Ashe Stadium, so loud, we saw her, you know, but it, it was crazy. And her mindset, and she talks about it, you know, she just stayed in her zone and her strength, and she went from match to match to match and uh, delivered the most uh, epic performance of her career. And, uh, you know, before that, you know, Dennis, was, Dennis is and is doing an amazing job. And Felix is another wonder kid. Uh, Vasek had a phenomenal year. Uh, Milos, <laughs> the hose, it, it, we, we, it was our dream. We maybe had one, we had Howard Kelsey. Nestor did a great job. We didn't have this crop. 
to see her win the Grand Slam. Uh, I had planned to come to Montreal to the Rogers Cup. We give an actual full-size replica and I was gonna present uh, the trophy to her at home. That, was, that would have been great. But for me, it was super hard and I just sat there clenching to make sure that I wasn't crying uh, because everybody knows that I cry at Grand Slams. And to think this is a Canadian and later I, we, uh, we also give the coach uh, a replica trophy. Uh, so Sylvain, Sylvain Bruno, uh, we did that with Bianca and I lost it there. <laughs> All that emotion of 40 years came out right then. It was amazing. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it was special. And, you know, I think like, like a number of people, I'm the, I'm the type of um, tennis fan that will tune in. I'll watch the, the majors, right? And, and I have an extreme sense of pride when there's a Canadian pushing in those tournaments and that's when I'll if I'm not at home I tune in on the radio you, you know you I'll always watch the finals regardless of who it is but then you get really engaged and when you when you mentioned you know Bianca in the final and how you were acting you get I got the you know the goosebumps and the feels because it's it's a special moment that you don't you don't often special. get to see so yeah. that was uh, that was great so hopefully uh, she's healthy and we get to see more of those special moments with her and Chapo's performance this year at the Open, that, you know, the same kind of goosebumps. Yeah, uh, yeah so it's, it's exciting time for Canadian tennis. And, and ultimately, we know, we come back to these athletes are aspirational figures, they're role models. And certainly we want Canadians to play hockey, hockey, and more hockey, and, and basketball, and, and soccer. Yeah. Uh, but tennis is a great sport. Mind, body, and soul, you can play it, you know, for a lifetime. It's not expensive. Everyone thinks it's expensive. It's just not. So for Tennis Canada to, to, to have that foundation, to have the athletes who are, they are amazing ambassadors uh, for Canada. Uh, they are truly representative of the values of Canadians uh, and giving back. Um, it just really gives um, Canadian tennis a real opportunity to lift and to build upon that base. And the host of juniors that are coming up behind them, it's no accident. You know, we have this snowball effect. Confidence breeds confidence amongst the athletic community. And there are lots of little girls and young little guys out there going, hmm, if Felix can do it, I can do it. Yeah, that's a good sport for me. So it's amazing the power they have. Absolutely. Uh, okay, just uh, a quick wrap, Stacy. This was uh, this was wonderful. Thank you so much for your time. I feel like we went through a journey there. We had uh, the present in how we dealt and you dealt with uh, the pandemic and how we're leading into 2021. We had some amazing lessons in leadership that uh, we, we that you shared and, and passed on uh, through this. Um, your revenue strategies and how you were managing that process and and how you're deciding to play or not to play. Uh, and then some amazing conversation around uh, what, what you and your organization has been able to accomplish with regards to pay equity and gender equity in sport. Um, it's been a pleasure uh, getting to, I feel like I got to know you even though virtually through this. Uh, so that was great. And I, I personally look forward to the, to the time when we can all meet in person again and, and have those real um, conversations uh, in person and in the flesh. So thank you very much. Thanks for, uh, on behalf of Ryerson. Thank you for, uh, for doing this uh, on behalf of Dr. Sherry Bradish, who brought us together as well on this. Thank you very much. And uh, it's much appreciated.